The Culture Pop Podcast is brought to you by the Law Offices of Jacob M. Ronnie. Accident or injury, call Jacob M. Ronnie. Call Jacob. Hey, it's Mace. If you or a friend or loved one is injured in an accident, the first person you should call is my friend Jacob. When I did this, Jacob was great. He helped me by talking through the next steps, which really put my mind at ease. When you're injured in an accident, you got to have an expert. That's why you call Jacob, just like I did. Call Jacob, 844-24-JACOB. That's 844-24-JACOB. Or visit calljacob.com. Call Jacob. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Culture Pop Podcast. I'm Steve Mason, along with Sue Kalinsky. Sue Baloo, how you doing? I'm good, but I have to say that hair and makeup did not show up today. Oh, for me? For me. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, well, I, I spent a long time. No, well, well, it's it's apparent <laughs> that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you had some uh, major, uh, you had a major situation with your hair. You, but yes. you know what it is? Your hair is just, you have like perfect hair. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm proud of it. Yeah. It's better than anything else I got. My hair, <laughs> my hair. So uh, we've got a great guest today, Max Bornstein, who is the creator and the writer and the executive producer of Winning Time, which is coming back for season number two. So I went to see, you and I both see a lot of theater. What was the last theater you saw? A soldier's play. A soldier's play. And you liked that very much, right? I loved it. Now, that was not a singing and dancing show. There was some singing in it. Was there? Yeah, there was, a, there was some singing in it. But was it a musical? No, it's, no it, was, it was a dramatic piece, but there was, there was some singing. Okay. So, and, and, but you liked it very much? Very much. Okay. So I went to see Tina, the musical yesterday at the Pantages Theater. Ask me how it was. How was it, Steve? <laughs> really? Yeah. I am shocked because I was waiting for you to tell me that it was phenomenal. <laughs> how was the actress who played Tina? The actress who played Tina is unbelievable. I mean, here's the thing with the show. The the actress that plays Tina, spectacular. It's one of the most demanding roles I've ever seen on stage. I mean, she just goes and goes and goes. Here's my problem. There's all this sort of clunky um, background stuff. Like here she is as a little girl and here she is at the church and here she is. And I wanted, you know, I wanted that for mm -hmm. the whole show. So right. I was a little bit bummed. About the, the actress was just Amazing. Amazing. Well, I saw a clip of her dancing, you know, and yep. like later on in, in Tina's career. And I was thinking this woman, what a workout. And she must have trained for a long time because, you know, you're, you're not only just singing and dancing, you're doing it in heels. Yes. Yes. And one of the interesting things, Sue, is that this role is so demanding that there are two actresses playing Tina and they alternate back and forth. So like we went to a Sunday one o'clock show with one actress. Well, that's way too much for her to come back and do the six o'clock evening show. So it was a different actress and they alternate back and forth and back and forth. Um, I can only assume the other one is, uh, is equally as, as good. Uh, because this one just blew the doors off the place and it does get to a point. Is this the show you're going to see? Okay. It does get to a point where No, well, I'm not going to see it now. <laughs> now you now you work your way up to simply the best and you know the show, you know, bang up finish and a couple of songs after the uh the curtain and uh totally worth it. I'm glad I saw it, but eh, Oh, okay. Well, I believe that's... that is two things in a row that I have been less than positive about. I know. I yeah. know. You're going to have to uh I don't know. What's what's next on your list? To see? <laughs> what am I seeing next? Exactly. So, you know, a lot of people talking about AI now, the, the world is going to be run by AI for all intents and purposes. And there's obviously there's a writer strike going on right now. I think you're are you a member of the writer skill? I am. You yeah. are. OK. And SAG. And SAG. So here's one of the things that I think is most fascinating about AI. It's obviously, if I say write a law and order script, I swear to God, it can do it. Oh, yeah. Easy. I mean, it, 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 it can basically write anything. But the question is, 
is it is it good that's the question that is the question and you know i was reading an article with seth rogan who's got a very funny show right now called platonic with rose Byrne on apple plus um mm -hmm. really really good and one of the things that he talked about was well the difference between me and ai is that i can smoke a joint and my sense of humor is helped by that and you right. wonder if ai can ever be really truly weirdly absurdly funny they can't because there's no human emotion and i'm really glad you brought this up because there is a band out called um jam jam galaxy band have you okay. heard of this band no i haven't everyone in the band is human but they have an ai lead singer no really it's insane and she's not really singing it's kind of like if a robot did rap basically okay. so it's very stilted anyway there's a couple of like i guess the most famous of the robots that are around right now <laughs> and one of them was being interviewed on uh, a 60 minutes ish type i think it's maybe an australian 60 minutes or something like that okay and the there was narration underneath um the the the, the robot and the interviewer so okay. the narration is basically um talking about how the robot is um very concerned about the human race and what's going to happen to the human race and then they put in a disclaimer saying now mind you this is what the creator is 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 basically is the creator is is the one who's putting this in the robot's head Correct. so it's like well then the robot that's not what the robot is thinking because the robot cannot think you know yes so when you say that the robot is concerned about something no it's the person who's handling the robot who created the robot who's worried about the human Correct. race and robots robots ai they're not supposed to experience feelings so i'm worried that this robot says it's upset uh, it's having a feeling right it's in the feels so so that does concern me a little bit and and then they had that and then i I saw a clip from uh from some it was like some kind of like a ted talk kind of situation and this was years ago when when people when robots were first not first because they've been around a long time but it was the first time that this um particular robot uh and it was it was like it looked like a like a robot it didn't look like it wasn't they weren't trying to make it a humanoid or anything yeah, like that right right and she brought it out and it was tiny. I mean, it was like, you know, like 12, 12 inches or something the like that. The robot was 12 inches? Yeah, it was, it was tiny and it was sitting on a table and she, uh, she was calling it a, a robot that can tell jokes, right? Okay. So the jokes were, were really, really shitty, but one joke was actually a joke about, um, the Swiss, Sw the Swiss army. Okay. And how, you know, how do you expect them to actually win? Have you ever seen the Swiss army knife? You know, you know, you know, it's like, it, you know, I, it's the, you know, they got a fork and it was something like, and if you get, and if you can get past me, the guy behind me has a spoon. Yeah, well, right. That is a Jerry Seinfeld joke. No, it stole a Jerry it Seinfeld stole joke. A joke from Jerry Seinfeld. Oh, wow. And I didn't do it justice, but that was kind of the gist of the joke. Yeah. And yeah. he did that joke. Oh God, probably. 30 years probably one of his first jokes he did really? it like, like 30 years ago anyway um so and and that is the big sticking point with a lot of this ai stuff is that it's plagiarized yeah a lot of it is plagiarized that is true um although yeah. i will say that i got i got my joke for Stephen wright from uh ai i got it from chat gpt do you recall that joke I just know it was really lame. Why did the scarecrow win a prize? Because oh. it was outstanding in its field. See? <laughs> See? AI? Yeah. Well, you know, but was that but, an old Seinfeld joke? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think that might it may have been a Gary Shandling joke. I think. <laughs> yeah, there I think you it go. was Shandling. No, or Carrot Top. Yeah. Um 
But I think, but also you told me that you had, you had looked something up and cause I know like it can spit out like a term paper or something like yes, that. Yes, it can. But what it's doing is it's plagiarizing. It's not coming up with, it's not coming up with their own version of something. That's the mm. thing. It's not coming up with their own version. I, so you I don't. don't believe it will ever come up with its own version. Well, you know, what's bizarre about it being that it is run by humans. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, I think it will, but the, the people who are manning the robots, they're not writers. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. Uh, yeah, it's going to be fascinating to see where it goes. I know that's one of the big sticking points in the Writers Guild uh, strike is that, hey, you know, you, you can't just have AI write our stuff um, and exclude us from the process. So I, I know that's why the strike has gone on so long. So there's some fear there. Um, but I and I, I think rightfully so, because I do think these things are going to learn how to structure a joke and not necessarily steal one, but structure a joke and be able to figure it out. I put in there last week, I was just curious, uh, write a sitcom about a mother and daughter. And you know what? It wasn't great, but it wasn't the worst thing I've ever read. I'm sure there are some writing samples out there that suck. You oh, know. absolutely. Abs and there were shows on TV that suck. Yeah. Yeah. The writing is like, oh, really? Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's, but I do believe, like, I have a friend who was a TV writer for many, many years, very, very successful. And, you know, as time went on, it, you know, the, the jobs were few and far between. And he got a gig writing for some medical company, but like doing like two minute scripts or writing speeches and things like that. And he was saying, you know, there's going to be a time when what I'm doing um, is going to be given to a robot. Right. So there is going to be a sacrifice on a company's part to not have somebody as skilled because sure. they don't want to pay the money. Yep. You know, that's, you know, and that's really what that's, that's what it's all about. Oh yeah. Uh, no question about it. Yeah. It's going to be, it's fascinating. I'm fascinated by a, you know, I love technology. So, you know, AI, I'm all fascinated by it. So uh, before we get to Max Bornstein, I want to hit on a couple of things. First of all, you're on threads now, right? I am. I haven't done anything yet, but I'm on. At Sue.Kolinsky, you can follow Sue on threads. Uh, for me, same handle on threads as everywhere else. It's at Venice Mace, M-A-S-E. Uh, you can also, and I saw you in here, join our Culture Pop Podcast community on Twitter. Just hit the communities tab on Twitter and search for Culture Pop Podcast. We are in there talking movies and TV and pop culture and all that stuff. And as an experiment, Sue, I made some of these glorious culture pop podcast t-shirts. So here's how you can win one. Uh, you know, one of the, so, so we're growing the show, right? We appreciate you our most loyal people who are out there, you know, twice a week or however often we do the show and we appreciate that. Uh, but if you leave a five-star rating and leave a review on Apple podcasts or on YouTube and uh, drop us a note, Mace and Sue, at gmail.com, uh, you've got a chance to win one of these t-shirts. So those comments that you leave and those ratings that you, uh, you, you leave, they lift us up the charts a little bit and more people can discover the show. So we appreciate if you, uh, if you do that and help us to continue to grow things. Um, so, uh, here we go. Ready? Last year. Winning Time on HBO told the story of the beginnings of the Showtime Lakers. And now the show is back for season two, starting Sunday, August the 6th. We are lucky to be joined by executive producer, writer, and showrunner, Max Bornstein. Max, thank you so much for doing this. Oh, it's my total pleasure, Steve. Thanks for having me. So uh, I'm telling you, Winning Time, I don't know if you know this or not, but I do uh, middays on 710 ESPN, the Lakers flagship I do. radio I station. Know it well, uh, so I am like all over this. And every time an episode airs, we do like an hour of, of radio about it. So uh, we, we can't wait for it to come back. And I got to see it early. I, you know, I wonder for you, what made you the right guy to help turn Jeff Perlman's book into a television series? Well, I'm certainly the lucky guy in so far as I got the opportunity. Uh, for me, it felt it just it hit every spot. You know, I grew up in L.A. I'm a Lakers fan, but I've always, you know, 
I've always been looking for a way of telling a story about LA and how I think it has had this outsized impact, especially in the 80s and in that moment on creating culture. I think, you know, the NBA is obviously what it is today, this sort of crucible of so much of American culture and now global. And I think that started here with the Lakers. And, and I didn't really realize that until I read Jeff's book. Uh, and I was fortunate to have it sent to me by Jim Heck, who uh, uh, is co-creator of the show and a passionate Lakers fan and mutual friends told him that, uh, that uh, as he was looking for a writer, that there was this guy uh, who grew up in LA, who's almost as obsessive as he is. And, uh, <laughs> and, but really, honestly, it comes from a place of, uh, of looking through the lens of the Lakers at our culture. And I think like it, you don't have to be a sports fan or a basketball fan, I think to, uh, really appreciate the impact that this team had and the story had on, you know, on our world. So I know that there's, and look, it's no secret that there's been a lot of controversy about, um, about the show. And I wanted to know, I mean, I mean, how, how difficult is it to adapt a book, tell your story, and not ruffle feathers with the players, the real players? Well, I think, you know, I always say I couldn't imagine how odd it would be uh, for anyone to take my life, such as it is, and turn it into any kind of, uh, you know, filmed entertainment and uh, whether it be a documentary or docudrama or anything else. Uh, so I, I can't imagine what it would be like from the perspective of any of the characters I can say. And I think you guys must know as uh, you know, as experts in the field that it's been, you know, it's been incredibly heavily researched and it's coming from a place of deep respect and love for every one of these characters and for the story itself, for the significance of what, each of these people have done. Uh, so I think it's impossible uh, to make anything about, uh, a, you know, if two people are in a room uh, and one of them goes and tells that story, uh, the other person is going to have a difference of opinion about exactly what went down. And if you had a recorded version, it might differ from both of them. And we all know that from our experience of life. So from where we stand, it, our goal at every moment is to approach it from a place of research and respect. And, you know, we're trying simply to tell uh, as great a story about the incredible lives that these people lived. So it's weird to watch your show because I knew Dr. Buss, interviewed Dr. Buss, uh, Jerry West, uh, who, by the way, who never finishes a sentence without saying motherfucker. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, Magic, Kareem, Jeannie, to see the way they're portrayed is fascinating to me. Talk about casting. How much of it was physical appearance versus who could really come up with the essence of that character? Well, it had to be both. I mean, it just really was. It was, it, we, it, then the casting was the thing that from the very beginning, as we were fantasizing about the show and, you know, you write something, you just sort of imagine it in your head. And then there was this moment where rubber met the road and we looked at each other and Adam Kay and uh, the other executive producers and our incredible casting director, Francine Maisler, and we, asked ourselves, wait a minute, are we ever going to find, particularly Magic Johnson? Oh, that was yeah. really the first, that was our first sort of, because obviously it's not simply that you have to cast someone who can authentically look like they can play basketball like Magic or have a resemblance to Magic, but Magic in particular has such a personality. I mean, that's part of what made him special and unique and why he, you know, as a player, caught such an sort of uh, electrifying cultural moment because he had this charisma that was movie star charisma. And it's hard to find movie star charisma, even in movie stars, not to mention in what we knew we were going to have to look for, which is a person who was just starting out who was a relative unknown. He had to be about 19 years old. And we knew the, the people who we knew and we knew that there wasn't a magic among them. And so it was that was really finding Quincy Isaiah and, and not only someone who could embody the role from a standpoint of physicality and the sort of essence, that personality, but he's also an incredible actor and happens to be 
an incredibly gracious uh, young man. So that was the kind of thing without which we couldn't have the show. But then for every other character, it really is about, obviously there has to be a certain resemblance, but the most important thing was finding that essence. You know, John C. Riley, I think it's, it's impossible for me to imagine anyone else in that role. I, you know, it's because Jerry Buss is such a singular figure and we who come from LA and, you know, knew who he was, know who he is, but a lot of people don't. I think, in, you know, of all of these characters, he's the only one who never wrote an autobiography and doesn't actually have a biography, which is mm. astonishing because yeah. he's the, you know, this incredibly influential, uh, important figure and a wildly exciting and interesting one. So really for us, it's been a privilege to be able to be the people to get to tell Jerry Buss's story. Um, and, uh, and, and John is the person who, you know, without which like it's impossible to capture that mix of the sort of PT Barnum American <laughs> dreamer. Who's also a hustler who's, you know, who's, ready to, you know, run out like Wile E. Coyote beyond the ledge and just, you know, by, <laughs> by dint of removing his legs fast enough, stay afloat. So I wanted to know how much basketball was actually played, um, whether it was rehearsals, you know, prior to, you know, oh, shooting. Yeah. Yeah, a ton. I mean, that's all, it's all basketball. I mean, we have, we have an incredible unit. Uh, Idan Ravine is a great sort of uh, coordinator for us. And we have, uh, you know, each of the guys who plays, uh, who in plays one of our, you know, core basketball players, Magic, Kareem, Solomon, Quincy, you know, all those guys are not only rehearsing to act every day, they're going and they're practicing. Uh, and they have legitimate, they run drills and they run the plays. They, we rehearse the plays. Uh, you know, it's all, it's this incredibly intricate process because it's not simply, you know, if you've seen this season, you've seen that, like, you know, we play some pretty iconic games. And our goal with that is obviously to recreate the reality of what happened, but at the same time to do it in a way that you can't see on YouTube. So we get inside it. Uh, and we do that uh, with a combination of, you know, incredible um, sort of, you know, we have different kinds of camera people. You know, we have a guy on rollerblades who's just in there capturing the movement with the fluidity of the basketball, but it's not in order to do that. It's not simply them just playing basketball the way it's played. They are, but they have to do it in a slightly artificial way so that it looks real on film. And it's, it's taken for the guys who are our actors who have played, have some basketball experience and have become better and better. Uh, that's been its own learning curve, but it's also a learning curve for a lot of the guys who are real uh, professional and semi-pro guys who are basketball players all their lives, they have to learn how to play in a way that is, you know, better to be captured by our cameras. So sometimes that means slowing it down, exaggerating certain movements, you know, s s doing things that might, that, that, you know, we get this a lot where it's like, well, you know, they have to fight their instinct to guard someone in the right way because we need a camera in there. It's going to look right on film, but so there's a lot of it, but I, but we, in order to capture it, you know, we built our production designer designed this incredible uh, basketball court, full size basketball court on a soundstage with about 14, 15 rows around it, which are always filled with extras in period costume. And beyond that green screen. And so it's, Everything that you see when you see this season, the Forum or the Boston Garden, you're seeing VFX work and combined with incredible stunt work. That's like the level of Game of Thrones. It's just you can't tell it's VFX work because it all looks like the Boston Garden or it all looks like the Forum. And, but the fun of it for you know the background players who are sitting there for 12 hours watching this is that they are actually watching a bunch of basketball be played and you know the guys can't help but you know you know during between takes out do each other with dunk contests and have fun so it's uh being on our set is definitely amongst the more fun jobs you can have as a as an extra in hollywood so one of the cool things about the series is the way it's it's shot it's got this sort of 70s looking vibe and you sort of use mixed media. Sometimes it's shot normally. Sometimes it's filtered or through a frame of mm -hmm. film. I mean, it it creates this sort of energy 
to it. Uh, t- tell me about the philosophy of that look and kind of using those tools. Well, I think that it's, there's def- there's a beautiful philosophy behind it. Our, Todd Van Hazel, our DP, really developed that style uh, with Adam McKay on the pilot. And the whole idea, you know, when we wrote the, the, the pilot and then the initial scripts, it's it, it, we're, we were leaning into this sort of layered quality to the storytelling that, that uh, you know, it's not a documentary, but it has, because we've seen all of so much of the outside of this, we've as fans experienced aspects of this story on our own through the media that we remember, whether it's on our, you know, projection televisions is, you know, when we were growing up and, or like felt we're on the radio uh, or as fans seeing the photographs, there are all these images that we know so well, and we know them in a certain with a certain texture. Sometimes it's film, sometimes it's video, and so the idea was to really take that aesthetic and apply it to the story that we're telling. And what Todd did is he took not only we shoot on film, which is unusual, in yeah, film, right yeah. these days. Uh, but and he treats that film in a beautiful way that makes it really feel like a uh, film shot in the period. Uh, and at the same time, he we shoot on eight millimeter. Uh, we've created some of our own formats, or Todd and his and his guys have created an incredible some other formats of film. Uh, and we shoot on a video camera uh, called the Ikigami, which was the sort of pro video camera of that era. So when you remember watching golf. When wow. it would pan up into the sky, and you just have no idea, you know, b- based on the the pan of the shot that you're following a ball, yep. but you can't see a ball. That that was the Ikigami, and it was like a pre-beta format. And so Todd and his team found and re- and 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 fixed up a number of these cameras, and and uh, such that they record now onto uh, an actual disc rather than the video, but they use the same it's the same technology. And so what you're seeing is genuinely as close to a time machine as we can get visually. So I I remember the first day on the, on that we shot was the day um, on the golf course in the first episode of the show. Mm -hmm. And, and that particularly had a resonance to me because I growing up, it was like, I mean, my dad had golf on all the time. And I remember that, that eighties golf, it just looked so great but crunchy and degraded and uh, ble- bleeding and you can't you can try to recreate it with a filter but what we realized in that moment looking at it on our monitors as we were shooting on that video camera of the era was that suddenly you're transported back and the big re- revelation was that was really a discovery i think was that it looked so cool that they started using that camera and in regular dialogue scenes as well. There was some dialogue in that initial scene. And as you were looking at the characters, suddenly all the work of the makeup and the hair and the costumes took on another level because you were looking through this time lens and it felt as if you could have recovered that videotape from an old box. Uh, and so we started using that camera more and more uh, in every scene with no rules really, except does it feel right emotionally for the story we're telling? Does it transport you? And what we found is that so often rather than feeling like a, like a filter or something over the story, it actually had this strange impact of breaking down the barriers, almost like it is when you watch a old home movie and you suddenly feel like you're back there with your, with your relatives or whatever it is. And so that became a real part of our vernacular in our show. And it's became something that we started writing to more. So when, when you were writing this, cause you know, in, in this, in the show, there's a lot of levity. There's talking to the camera, you know, kind of like asides. When you were writing this, um, was, was that in mind that it was going to be shot that way? Or that's something that just doesn't get put into the equation till well, later? It, uh, initially it, Writing the pilot, you know, when I wrote the pilot, I had no conception of that. Certainly, that 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 would be the way that that it was um, it was realized. Though, but but the talking to the camera and things like that was very much incorporated into the script and was part of what the idea was. And I think and became, I think, part of the influence for uh, why Todd and Adam decided and and Hank Corwin who edited the pilot and brought a lot of that because some of that was his experimentation where we had this extra footage, but it was almost sort of on a lark, 
Like there was an extra camera lying around that. So why not capture it with video? But we're planning on using the standard conventional format. And then when Hank was playing around, and this is the guy who, I mean, he edited JFK and Natural Born Killers mm-hmm. and, and Adam's films. And he's just brilliant. And his thing is that he's ex- he's an experimenter and he doesn't, he just, if he, if there's a rule, he wants to break it uh, and, and follow emotion. And he started doing that and it became clear that, that that would work. But in the writing, there was a similar philosophy, which was just follow whatever feels like the right way to tell the story. And part of having people talk to camera is a sort of documentary style thing to do. Now we're not doing it explicitly in a documentary way. It's much more sort of, uh, at least our goal with it is always to have someone talking to camera if it's adding something that you couldn't get just in the text of it. In other words, if Jerry Buss is telling you uh, about how he's doing his business deal, it's not just about the facts of the business deal. It's so that we can see the way he's trying to keep plates spinning and feel him sort of feel the anxiety that he's kind of covering up by saying it's going to be okay. You know, so it, it's giving you a kind of emotion you couldn't just get if you played it straight. And uh, I think that's the same philosophy that like that now that pervaded the show aesthetically, which is about like, whatever it takes to tell the story best. And if that means an animated sequence, or if that means, re- you know, recreating the moment in airplane with Kareem or whatever feels like the right way to tell this story, the team has been sort of completely game and HBO has been completely game. So uh, I'm wearing my Lakers hoodie today. Sue is wearing Celtic screen. Yeah. Uh, it- just <laughs> accidental. It's no, technically it's green. <laughs> I forgive I, I, I'm, I'm, an, I'm actually a Knicks fan. Okay, just want that's to put that a, on the that's record. That's a very, right? that's a very so, respectable I, so, fandom. Yes. yes. Okay. My parents so. are both from New York. I know. I know. Well, it's not a. It, it since they they left in the seventies, and that's about the last time it was really really good. But well, yeah, it, yeah I, I should actually be wearing black all the time. Yeah, exactly. Being a Knicks exactly. Fan, in so. the morning. Uh, <laughs> but as every Laker fan should, I hate the Celtics. Um, but I am glad that in season two we get the Larry Bird uh, Celtics. They get equal time in season two. Somewhat Michael Chiklis, fantastic. Oh, and Red Auerbach, incredible. In terms of developing the story and ultimately ending. Uh, the ending of season two it it feels much richer because you've got that Celtics backstory I assume that's kind of where you were going for when you structured the script yeah when we were thinking about it you know last year we always knew you know from the very beginning that you cannot tell the story of the Lakers without the Celtics and you can't tell the story of magic without uh, uh, without Larry Bird and really you can't tell the story of Dr. Buss without Red Auerbach and and because those two those two franchises are the, as I would argue like the most entwined and most fascinating rivalry in sports. Yeah. But coming into our show in season one, it was hardly a rivalry at all. It was the kind of rivalry you have with an older brother who doesn't think about you. You know, the Lakers were there (laughs) trying desperately to, and they'd never, never gotten over the hump. So it, you know, the Celtics kept West up at night, but he never won and the Celtics never lost. So up until, and now we look at it and obviously those teams are basically on par and, that, and that's because of what happened here. This was the, the big reversal, but uh, it come the Lakers. It's really hard to think about the Lakers as underdogs now, but yeah. the Lakers were the underdogs. I mean, they were a great storied franchise that was absolutely the underdog team and, and not just in terms of the record, but then psychologically. And so we knew that, that even though first season, because of the nature of that first Cinderella year where the Lakers, you know, came together, drafted magic and won, but didn't play the Celtics in the finals, we knew that we wouldn't be able to bring that rivalry to full flower, but we had to plant the seeds. And we knew that this season had to be that Empire Strikes Back year that we that that, you know, I mean, people who know the true story know where it ends and I don't need to yep. kind of uh, give it up. But, uh, you know, it didn't it wasn't overnight that the Lakers sort of got that monkey off their back uh, and uh, and uh, and finally sort of like won. Uh, but facing the Celtics uh, was something that we knew uh, was just sort of the that's the ultimate test for them. 
And to do it after having won in that first year, and now with the, all the problems that come with victory, uh, with being a champion, with overnight success, uh, all personal problems, you know, for Magic to be able to have to come out that second year with now every expectation on his shoulder, uh, except still being talked about uh, as if, you know, maybe it was the fact that he had a better team and that Bird may still be the better player. Uh, and then, you know, all the internal squabbles that happen on a team that get exacerbated by success and ego uh, and leadership questions because we're still dealing with Paul Westhead versus Pat Riley uh, and who the coach is ultimately going to be. So. The idea that all of those things are stacked against them and now they're finally going to have to face the, the, the bitter rival. But we knew that if we told that story just from the standpoint of the Lakers, uh, and kept the Celtics at a remove, uh, it would be unsatisfying because at the end of the day, that's not the story. Like there's no villains in sports. There's only your perspective. And that whole, uh, you know, I grew up in LA and I hate the Celtics too, but I respect the Celtics. Yeah. And, uh, and I know, and, and part of what we're doing is telling the story, uh, as it is for these characters who lived it. And for, for magic, as we know, there's, only, there's no one he, that he has a deeper bond with ultimately than Larry Bird. Uh, and that's really the thing that I think is just so fascinating that it goes from a place of in that first season, him looking at him, from the outside as this, you know, uh, you know, this rival or this sort of like uh, surface level character. And then as we get to know more about him this season and magic ultimately as well, we realize that he's every bit as, uh, as, as motivated, driven, uh, and, um, an impressive, uh, an athlete and a human being as magic and overcoming some unbelievable odds. And so, yeah. By the time we get to the finale of this season, even though we're desperate for the Lakers to pull it off, we're also torn uh, yeah. because we feel that uh, that humanity on the other side. Uh, and, and hopefully that's something that this show can continue to deepen because um, I think real sports fans completely understand that and relate to that. You have to take your hats off to those to those rivals. Yeah. And what, what I love so much about this past season, you know, I'm a huge sports fan and I don't remember everything that happened during those years. So I really watched it like I was reliving it in, in mm -hmm. some ways. And then in other ways, there were things that I forgot. Right. So I was watching it kind of in real time, you know, <laughs> and like, oh, is he going to make the shot? And, you know, and so it really did have that thrill factor. Um, well, that's been like, that's great to hear. And, you know, it's really, I think at every level, it's, uh, that's always sort of the, that's the challenge, both in, in, in the writing and in every part of the execution for us is we know on some level where these things end and a lot of people will, but the argument for why are we doing this? Like, it's not simply to recreate uh, things that we know it's to get inside and live a, a great story emotionally. And we, as fans experienced that story as our story from the outside, when we watched it the first time, if we watched it the first time, or if you're too young to have done that, you experienced it having read about it and whatever. And you all, we all have our perspective on it, but the reason that we're telling this story uh, in this dramatized fashion is because it's one of the great American stories, I believe. Uh, I think, you know, on the, again, Jerry Buss, one of the great American innovators, Magic Johnson, one of the uh, incredible uh, American icons of culture, not just of sport. Uh, in fact, I think it's because of what happened in that era and what Magic brought as a personality to the game of basketball that basketball has become uh, the sport that has taken over the world. I think without Magic and Bird, there is no Michael Jordan. And without Jordan, there is no modern NBA. And there aren't, you know, we don't have uh, players coming from France and getting drafted, you know, as the first pick. It just doesn't that, it, it, when this story began, the NBA was the sort of backwater leak. Yeah. Uh, you know, real aficionados cared. But for the, you know, and there were, you know, there was a core group of fans, but at the end of the day, it was baseball, it was football, 
uh, and hockey even was bigger and golf was bigger. Every network would rather have had golf on their hmm. air uh, than the NBA. And a big part of that was because they thought golf had like a wealthy fan base, but that all changed. And now we have, you know, I've, I am sure as you guys have, I'm sure, you know, you go to China, you go to Europe, you see the, the billboards of basketball mm -hmm. players. You know, mm -hmm. that is a, that is an American export now, uh, as big as Hollywood, if not bigger, you know, and I think that is, that is because of the vision, uh, of these characters. You know, because uh, I'm a Lakers fan and cover the Lakers, I know all the major beats of the story as season two rolls along, but endlessly fascinating. And as I mentioned, we talk about it on the show uh, a lot, but I, my mom, who doesn't know from Pat Riley or Paul Westhead <laughs> or Jerry West or any of these guys is also fascinated by the show. Somehow it works for her too. It's kind of a complicated way of asking, how do you make it authentic enough for NBA fans while still making it accessible to people who don't know sports? Well, I, I mean, I'd love that. I'd love to hear that. And I hear that a lot. And it's always, that's the, that for me is the best, kind of compliment about the show and it's a, it's really our aim and i think the way to do it i think there's universality and specificity I, I think like in authenticity if we're able to you know when you watch the the wire or you watch the sopranos or you watch breaking bad or any of the great shows that are you know aspirational from my standpoint as to the kind of thing you would love to be able to to touch uh it's always that they're creating something that feels authentic to its world and in being authentic to its world you find a touchstone to your own world uh it's not trying to spoon feed you uh or sort of you're you have to catch up to some of the lingo and the terminology whether it be about the, the meth trade and breaking bad or the the mob world and the sopranos but they're not they're not spoon feeding you uh, those worlds, they're just dropping you into a well-rounded world. And, and part of the beauty of this story for, you know, selfishly as one of the storytellers is that we're just being, we're gifted this incredible American epic. And that's how we look at it. I mean, it is an epic American story. It has people from all walks of life, from all around the country, which speaks to all different parts of American culture in this formative moment. And the characters themselves are larger than life, all of them, you know, whether it be their, and their personalities are larger than life, their accomplishments are larger than life. Uh, like you say, the way they talk, it's, they're funny people, uh, charismatic, interesting people that everyone who's covered them has known and being able to use that world and portray it authentically, it's interesting, even if you have no interest in the outcome of the sports. And it becomes, I think I've noticed, a way in. We've had people who work on the show who don't care about sports, our, our casting director, or some people who become obsessed with basketball because this is their way into seeing the stories. And we as fans all know that what we love about sports goes beyond just the stats and the outcome. It's about the stories of the people playing it. And you talk to any sports fan, they know who, where people came from. They know those rivalries. They know what people overcame. And so for us, the more we're able to tell that authentically, and obviously that means, you know, we can't tell the entire story and no one wants to watch an 82 game season recreated on HBO. So we're going to have to find the big important beats, but to be able to do that as authentically as possible and make the world feel as authentic as possible, I think is what allows people who aren't inherently interested in the subject matter to become invested because they realize there's a smell of something that feels real, uh, even if you don't know what they're talking about. Like you listen to that dialogue and if it sounds like they know what they're talking about, you follow along. It doesn't have to dumb it down uh, in order to explain it. I want to give a shout out to your music supervisor and mm. anyone else involved with picking the songs for these two seasons. And I'm going to mention a couple Dave, of songs. Dave Gilfer is our music supervisor and he's phenomenal. Phenomenal. And I, I'm going to mention three of the songs. I'm not going to mention where they are because <laughs> I don't want to give anything away. But I thought these three songs were just used so brilliantly. So the first one was Traffic's Dear Mr. Fantasy. Mm, one of my favorites. And where it was placed 
And the nature of that scene to play that song, I thought was brilliant. Mm. Uh, Won't get fooled again. <laughs> and where that was played. And the last one was uh, what is and what should never be by Led mm. Zeppelin. Mm-hmm. It was such, such a right on smart, smart choice. Well, thanks. And we have an incredible team, music team, and everyone's sort of very involved. And we had always have a lot of fun with it. And, and people are always pitching different songs. And it's just, uh, this year was very exciting. We were able to get a lot of really, really cool songs. Yeah, I love. I want to ask you Mr. one Fantasy non-winning moment. time question. Yes, sir. Uh, you were one of those kids who always knew what he wanted. You wanted to work in the business. So tell me the story of 13-year-old Max Bornstein <laughs> calling Oliver Stone's production office. Well, I had, I got, I grew up in LA, and I think it's in the water when you're here. Perhaps I certainly knew. I was the kid when I was 12 who was renting everything there was to rent from the Tower Video, which was like the best video store I could find in the Valley. It was the one that had like all the old foreign films. So I would go, I would come home from school and I would rent three movies, which was the max uh, every night. And I had <laughs> two VCRs hooked up. And as I did my homework, I would dub the movies and you had to play them while they dubbed no one remembers dubbing if they're not yeah you know, right of age right. but like and so i ended up video i ended up copying just for myself over you know over a thousand videos uh just like that and knew just fell in love and uh with movies and um my mom was she sold insurance uh and she randomly met someone uh in her insurance sales who worked at uh, Oliver Stone's production company. And she knew that that's something I wanted to do. And she, she asked them just like, would you, you know, are you guys looking for any internships? And I think every year they had college interns, but I was 13. They didn't know that. And my mom (laughs) gave me the phone number and because they said, sure, here's the number of the people who interview the, and so I called them up uh, and I got an intern, uh, an interview uh, which I could not drive to on my own. And my dad graciously drove and like sat in the lobby. And it was, and I, <laughs> and I didn't realize, I now look back at it and I know that they thought this was going to be a USC student or something. Uh, and I went in there, this chubby pimply kid, uh, and, uh, and, and they had this interview and I, I, you know, I, I now know in retrospect what they thought and they thought like, okay, this is, you know, this kid seems a little precocious and certainly interested. And they said, it's going to, the job's going to suck. Uh, but what do you, you know, you're just going to, you know, photocopy things and whatever. And I was thrilled with photocopying and pouring coffee or whatever <laughs> I had to do. So they, they said, you know, here, fill out an employment form. And by the time I got home, to the valley from Santa Monica, which is where their offices were, there was a message on another archaic thing in the answering machine. Oh yeah, and that and it's and they said they'd looked at my the lawyers from the company had <laughs> looked at my in, employment form and realized that I was thirteen years old and therefore I could not work there. Uh, but the guy who I had interviewed with took pity, and he called. <laughs> yes, he, he said I could call him back, which I did. And he invited me to come in and he started giving me screenplays. And I didn't know so that wasn't a thing you could get online in those days. I mean, it was, this was like, you know, it sounds so dated, but it really changed overnight where you couldn't find screenplays just as a kid. Uh, yeah. And I didn't, and I knew things were written, but I didn't really know what that meant. And uh, I knew I wanted to make movies, but then gi- having him give me the screenplays that were the hot things that hadn't come out yet in that moment. So I read like, Fight Club and American Beauty and Sixth Ooh. Sense. I remember reading The Sixth Sense. And then when the movie came out, I didn't remember what it was called. But then in the middle of watching the movie, I was like, oh, this is the one where the, the kid is, uh, <laughs> you know, where, uh, where it's, he's dead the whole time. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and so I had this incredible uh, mentorship, honestly, that came out of that, which was it's an incredible gift. Uh, and it's been, and it's paid dividends. The guy's name was John Krause. He's a, he's still, I talked to him and he has been a mentor to me. Uh, you know, I, I have a similar story I wanted to tell you, which is I grew up as uh, in minor league baseball. So I was working for the Toledo Mud Hens. They were the AAA affiliate of the Minnesota Twins. And <laughs> I, I got to know the rhythm of minor league baseball. Um, and so when, uh, 
Stephen Bochco, I loved Hill Street Blues. Mm. When Stephen Bochco came along, they announced in the trades that he, and I was the one kid that subscribed to the trades in Toledo, right. Ohio. Um, <laughs> they announced he was going to do a minor league baseball show uh, called, uh, I think it was called Bay City Blues. So I did the natural thing, which is uh, I called information. I asked for Stephen Bochco's Amazing. office. <laughs> I called Stephen Bochco direct. I asked for him like through two secretaries, asked for him. <laughs> Uh, and he gets on the phone and I explain, I work in minor league baseball and I, I think I could be a base. He said, write me a letter with all of the background that you have and I will I use it, it on the show. It was, uh, I was, I was a heady little kid. It sounds like you were too. Absolutely. Well, I mean, it's so great. And then it, 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 uh, I always certainly, whenever I talk to people who, who try to, who want that, who want something that much, I try to help, but it's like when you're it's it's incredible the on the other side for the generosity of and it's and I, it's impressive i get it if i'm steven bochko and i get that call i get it it's cool it's cool <laughs> that this kid's calling from toledo uh and and because you were that kid you know and it's like i think but it but there are you know jerks out there who don't uh who don't respond that way so it's really special and we all have i think we do we all have some version of that person in our lives who had the generosity to be able to say, sure, show me what you got. Yeah. So I got one last thing for you. And this is, so this is the constant conversation is documentary versus based on real events. Sure. So I, I want to ask you about one particular uh, scene and speech uh, Dr. Jerry Buss gives, we'll call it the monopoly speech. Mm -hmm. um, and it's fantastic. He talks about winning at all costs. He berates Jim and Johnny, doesn't understand their lack of competitiveness, all that stuff. John, Riley, John C. Riley's amazing in that scene. So I guess you're the guy, and I don't know if there was a night like this, and I don't know if there was a conversation mm -hmm. like this exactly, but you're the guy that kind of comes up with a scenario and puts the words in the characters' mouths. Is that kind of what happens? Uh, me and and the and my really incredible collaborators, Rodney Barnes, Jim Hecht, and yeah, that's I, I like our, our. What we try to do is we try to research everything we know about these people, uh, and then imagine our way into through our own experience the kinds of emotions you're going through when you're you know when you're uh, the the children of this incredibly successful but demanding guy who you know has not always been around at every moment of your lives and who is trying to recreate a family that he never had and like there are things that are universal about that and we take our best stab at channeling what feels real and true and authentic to that moment and that character and we also know jerry bus was an obsessive monopoly player uh <laughs> and which felt you know sometimes you learn facts about these characters that you don't know where to put them uh, or what it means. And sometimes you have facts that they feel like they fit <laughs> right into who that character really is. You know, and this is a guy who's a bootstraps uh, Horatio Alger success story came coming out of the bread lines and the dust bowl of, of, uh, you know, uh, of the, the, the great North, you know, and it's like, well, how do you, that character for him to be obsessed with monopoly the game of uh of becoming a mogul means something right yeah. he became yeah. a real estate mogul himself and in fact he named many of his buildings after places uh, uh in monopoly there are uh -huh. a lot of places in santa monica that are named uh broadway and different places like buildings and, and residential buildings that he named uh, because of his obsession with that game, because for him, it was this metaphor for the ability to go to from rags to riches. And so, uh, and he played it with his family. We know those things. Do we know exactly what transpired in all those rooms? Of course not. Uh, but, uh, but that feel, that's our job in dramatizing it, uh, to, to try to get into that moment and do it as authentically as, as, you know, as we can. And, uh, and then John, in that particular scene, which is one of my favorites too. Uh, it's, you know, his performance is just extraordinary and the camera work is extraordinary and it just feels like your, it feels like a fight and an argument that we've all had with our parents. Uh, that is where we say things we maybe do or don't want to take back, but it, 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 it just 
strikes a chord. And, and that's our goal is, again, to try to take this story that is very specific uh, and find those universal moments that people can connect to. And suddenly these characters who, you know, whose shoes we will never be in, you know, like, well, I will never own a basketball team. And, uh, and, and yet I can uh, hopefully watch this show and feel that a lot of what these people go through is the same uh, as, you know, what we go through with our yeah. parents and kids. Well, listen, uh, Max, this has been great. Uh, let everybody know season two of Winning Time premieres on Sunday, August 6th on Max. Absolutely love the show. Uh, congratulations on it. Excited for season two. I know everybody's going to love it, particularly uh, Laker fans and basketball fans. Thanks a lot for doing this, man. Steve, thank you. Sue, thank you. It's been such a pleasure. Big fan of the show, and I'm always listening, so I really appreciate it. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, Max. Thank you. There you have it. Winning time season two. Cannot wait for you guys to get a chance to watch it. We, I feel like what's, what's really hard is, so I've seen it and nobody else I work with has seen it, including the voice of the Lakers, John Ireland. Um, <laughs> and I'm also embargoed. So I left him little breadcrumbs, but I can't really say much about the show. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, it's, it's awkward, but I feel lucky to have seen it. Yeah, me too. Um, and, you know, one thing that I didn't say to Max, when he was talking about the casting, for me, if a character, if an actor doesn't resemble who they're playing yes. enough, I am checked out. Yeah. I am totally checked out. And it really is uncanny how they found people that look so much like the, like the real players, like, like Michael Cooper. Yeah. And, oh yeah, and, and Larry Bird. Larry I mean, Bird is uh, on spot on. I mean, if you just saw this guy on the street, the way he looked, you would think, "Holy shit, that's Larry Bird." Yeah, yeah. And and his mannerisms and the way he shot. I yeah. mean, it was just so authentic. So really, kudos to them for being able to do something that's that's very difficult to be able to put all those elements together. Now, what um, I've been trying to figure out is if uh, Jerry West is going to take this all the way to the Supreme Court, like he would, like he did over season one. I, Supreme Court. Supreme Court. <laughs> well, you know what? The Supreme Court takes on some things that I'm, you know, that are very yeah. suspect. So <laughs> yes, I wouldn't be surprised if they take it on. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you one last Jerry West story. Um, I, I told this to Max off the air, but uh, so we we're out at Riviera. John and I were doing the show and we had heard in advance, we were going to interview Jerry we, off the course. Uh, we had heard he had a hole in one on six or whatever it was. He had a hole in one. So I thought, Oh, Jerry's going to come in. He's going to be in great mood. This is going to be great mood, Jerry. And uh, I said, Jerry, congratulations. Hole in one. And he said, yeah, I missed that motherfucking putt at 17. I'm like, <laughs> and that is Jerry West in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. That is who he is. So I think they came a lot closer to capturing him on screen than Jerry might have imagined he would be portrayed. They nailed yeah. it. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think that, you know, one thing that another thing that I didn't say, I think if I were magic, the thing, one of the things that I would be really pissed off about is the ring that he gave Cookie, the That's engagement right. ring, because it was such a crappy kind of <laughs> pedestrian <laughs> ring you know it's like something you would get out of like a bubblegum machine and i thought oh my god i mean he was making way too much money yes to give her a ring like to that to give her that ring exactly yeah. uh well want to remind you on the way out here uh follow us on uh threads i'm at venice mace sue is at sue.kalinsky um by the way my handle is at venice mace for all social media uh you can also join the culture pop podcast community hope to see you there uh that is on twitter and again if you would like to win a culture pop podcast t-shirt uh leave us a five-star rating and a review on apple podcasts or on youtube and then drop us an email mace and sue at gmail.com sue it's great seeing you and we will see everybody next time on the Culture Pop Podcast. <laughs>